So I thought the whole point of these one-shot color cameras was to reduce the expense and the amount of time I needed to spend capturing and processing astro images. And, you know, generally that's true for broadband targets. And, I'm, and when I say broadband, I'm talking about targets like galaxies, globular clusters, reflection nebula, and even some emission nebula. But the fact of the matter is, is that one-shot color cameras do not produce the same stunning show palette images that we typically see when we use a mono camera with narrow band filters. But that doesn't mean that we cannot use narrow band filters with these one-shot color cameras. In fact, we can. I'm David with Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory. And today we are going to be talking about the ASCAR D1 and D2 filter set. How I use these filters with my ASI 2400 MC Pro camera to capture narrow band data and then process that data to generate really cool show palette images, uh, including one of Pac-Man NGC 281. And so uh, we're going to uh, obviously cover the basics of OSC cameras, uh, one-shot color cameras. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about my session notes for this particular target. I'll cover the PixInsight workflow that I use to generate the show palette image. And uh, then finally, we'll take a, a brief astronomical tour of this really cool deep sky object. So sit back, enjoy. I, I'm going to do my best to make this a fun one. So one shot color cameras capture broadband data using a Bayer matrix. And that incorporates red, green, and blue filters over the sensor pixels to produce a full color image in a single exposure. Hooray, terrific, this is awesome. But this is broadband data, and it's a blend of visible wavelengths. So it has a very wide spectrum. And when we're shooting DSOs, many DSOs, we want to narrow our data to specific emission lines, namely hydrogen alpha, O3, and S2. Filters like the ASCAR D1 and D2 set, they isolate the narrowband wavelengths associated with these emission lines. And that allows one-shot color cameras to achieve greater contrast and detail in these narrowband DSO targets. Of course, there are other manufacturers of these filters. There's Optolong, there's Ant Antlia, there's Astronomic, Chroma, etc. And to be clear, I have no horse in this race. I simply wanted to try this approach and see if it worked. So I chose NGC 281 as my target because it's a strong emission region. And if these filters are going to work, they better work with Pac-Man. Okay, let's do a quick rundown on my session notes. Uh, obviously, I'm using my Celestron C11 XLT. Using that at uh, prime focus, meaning f10, so the focal length is 2800 millimeters, and that produces a field of view of about three quarters of a degree by half a degree when using the 2400 MC Pro camera, two inch filters, the ASCAR D1 D2. Only other thing I'll note is that I'm using a CM 120 mount, very well polar aligned, very stable, and I have a Bader Diamond Steel Track Crayford Focuser for fine focusing. Now, Pac-Man is in Cassiopeia, and that means that it's uh, visible in the Northern Hemisphere all year round. I gathered data over three nights, starting on September 12th, ending on September 15th. And uh, all the data was captured from my observatory, the Astro DNA Observatory in Warwick, New York. I have to tell you, the moon was fairly uh, illuminated throughout these sessions, but one of the benefits of these narrow band filters is that moon moonshine is, is 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 kept at bay i will say that i had an extraordinary streak of wonderful seeing which enabled me to gather this much data in such a short period of time specifically i was able to gather 179 frames ultimately two minute exposures game 140 offset 25 with the d1 filter 178 two minute exposure game 140 offset 25 with the d2 filter i ran an experiment i ran 60 by 15 second gain 0 20 offset 25 on uvir meaning no filter and i also did 30 by 30 seconds gain 140 offset 25 i found that the 30 by 30 uh, a uvir data performed perform better. Overall, that's everything you need to know about the session itself. And well, I, I think we got some really decent 
stacks over a course of three nights. Okay, so let's process the data that we captured. I created stacks uh, from my raw files, and uh, I have videos that cover pre-processing and stacking using Serial, and those tutorials cover my mono workflow, and there are some differences in the stacking process for one-shot color cameras. If there is an interest, I will happily produce a video on one-shot color camera pre-processing and stacking using Serial. Just let me know in the comments below. Everybody has their own uh, preferred PixInsight workflow. Mine is relatively straightforward, and I'm a huge fan of simplicity. I'm also a fan of knowing what each process does in terms of the overall workflow. So let's start with the easy stuff. You know, register and align your stacks, and that means your D1, D2, and broadband stacks uh, need to match up, and uh, that's a straightforward process. And then usually, you know, I do a crop, a dynamic crop. Uh, I'm using a you know full frame sensor here. I have a lot of uh, a leeway here how I would crop my image so I go for a pleasing something pleasing that um, also removes any of the misaligned edges or any artifacts that might exist on the edge of the uh, of the image circle and then I throw an automatic background extraction you can use dynamic background extraction if you prefer but you know ABE does a fairly decent job at least for the level of image quality that I'm going for with this demonstration and uh, and at that point, we have uh, three images that need to be, um, I guess, let's say normalized against a reference. And that's when we use linear fit. So I use the broadband stack as my reference, and then I match the intensity levels of D1 and D2 to the broadband data. And uh, I, I find that gives me the best results. At this point, we're still in the linear stage, and I like to throw... Um, blur exterminator and noise exterminator at at the data and here we can see pretty clean ir star data pretty clean d1 data and pretty clean d2 data at this point i break off my processing a bit and i apply um spcc which is spectro photometric color calibration to my broadband uh data and that requires that i do an image solve first because we've lost all of that coordinate system data when we uh, did our crops. And what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to make sure that my broadband stars, my stars, which uh, I'm going to pull star data from my broadband stack, I want to make sure that the stars have relatively accurate color. To do this, I use star exterminator on the broadband data to isolate my colored stars, but I also do it to the D1 and D2 stacks because I'm not going to be using any star data from the D1, D2 stacks, and uh, I'm just going to be using them for the nebulosity. And now we have our starless narrowband data. And so how, how do we go from these kind of two, uh, uh, you know, color... Um, D1, D2 stacks, and how do we get this to a show palette? And we're going to do that by splitting the D1, D2 starless images into their respective RGB channels. And the result of this is going to be um, uh, an R, R, G, and B files for the D1, and of course, R, G, and B files for the D2. And now we get to the cool part. We know that the D1 data is actually hydrogen alpha and O3 signal. So what we're going to do is rename these RGB channels for the D1 stack, and we're gonna take the red channel and we're gonna rename that to hydrogen. We're gonna take the green and blue channel and we're gonna rename those to O1 and O2 respectfully. On the D2 channel, we know that this is a combination of S2 data as well as O3 data. So we're gonna take the red channel and rename it to sulfur and then the G and B get renamed to O3 and O4. We do this and we wind up with a total of six files. Still not show. Well, to create an O from the four O channels that we've created, we simply integrate them. And to do this, we're going to first need to save the files out into a format that PixInsight prefers for its integration step. Once we do that, we run the uh, image integration process and we wind up with our final O channel. And now we have our sulfur from our D2 red. We have our hydrogen from our D1 red. And we have our integrated O3. 
And from there, we can go into traditional show processing. Okay, so I've moved the broadband stars as well as the uh, SHO channels into a show workspace. Obviously, these images look horrible because they're in the linear state and they have an auto stretch applied to them. We're going to take that auto stretch off and we're going to manually stretch each of these. And I'm going to speed this up uh, for convenience. Uh, but just apply your stretches to your narrowband data gently, incrementally, stretch to taste. There are a number of terrific videos out there on how to, how to stretch, and I, I don't pretend to be an expert at this. I stretch, uh, it, it, at this point, it's largely uh, to taste. So what I try to do is just make sure that each of the narrowband channels has... Uh, 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 close to the same um, background level and that I reveal as much of the nebulosity uh, at a contrast level that I think brings out detail but does not blow out the highlights. So, you know, this is a combination of the curves tool as well as the histogram tool. At any rate, when you uh, have your final SHO channels stretched, we can move to a combine, an LRG combine, just simply don't supply luminance uh, channels, just supply your S as red, your H as green, and your O as blue, and you're going to get some uh, show palette representation. And uh, I actually happen to really like uh, how vibrant these colors are, clearly a little bit of a balance issue on the red, uh, but these are adjustments that you can make uh, inside of PixInsights or outside of PixInsights. Just remember that um, show palette is false color, meaning this is a, a creative work. So as you can see, there are lots of different ways you can present uh, your nebulosity uh, with the show palette. In the end, I'll choose something that I'm happy with. And we got to turn our attention to the stars. Okay, so we got to bring the stars out of a linear state and get them to a stretched state. And I use a combination of tools. I might start with the histogram just to kind of bring the stars out. And you can see in the preview, they start to uh, appear on the screen. And, uh, and then I'll uh, often toggle between the histogram transformation and the arc sine H stretch tool. And there's a reason for this. So the arc sine... Uh, uh, H stretch tool will uh, help to preserve the color of the stars um, and uh, where the histogram and the curves uh, tools will, will tend to wash that color out and uh, everything gets kind of converted to uh, bright white. So there's a balance there and uh, you kind of just gently apply uh, arc sine H and, uh, and the histogram tool or the curves tool, and you'll finally get to uh, a spot where your stars are uh, sharp, uh, they're apparent, and they have the color balance that you, that you want. And uh, once you have a, a star field, you can then uh, rescreen those stars onto the starless image using pixel math. And there's a you know very well published formula for rescreening these stars. And once you do that, you have your final combined image. And I, I won't call it, you know, I say final, but it's really not. There's, there's lots of room here for uh, all sorts of tweaking of the image. And uh, I'll probably spend a few minutes just um, getting this to the balance that I'd like. And then we'll shift into the astronomical tour. Awesome, we have a final image of the Pac-Man Nebula, NGC 281. Now, what the heck is it? Well, this is a um, very, very strong emission region. It's about 48 light years in diameter. It gets its name because it's supposed to look like Pac-Man, and it does in smaller aperture telescopes where the field of view is, is wider than the C11. Um, but uh, where are the emissions coming from? Well, the emissions are coming from IC1590, which is the center star cluster um, that, that we see illuminating or uh, 
creating all of this bright nebulosity. These are some um, pretty um, intense, supermassive, bright young Oost type stars that are fueling uh, all of this emission uh, and this radiation. The radiation from these stars pushes and erodes the interstellar dust and you can see these pillars that are pointing back towards the central uh, region of the star cluster. You know, this is th th this is dust and, and, and gas that's resisting the pressure of that radiation. And this is where new stars are going to form and join this cluster. And then there are these really dark, dramatic areas where the dust is so thick that even the radiation from the star clusters cannot penetrate it. And then these dark, uh, very dark structures form. And I think that adds the dramatic uh, effect of this photograph. I think this is a great target for the Ascar D1 and D2 uh, filters. And just look at the range of color here that we were able to capture. This is obviously a lot of data. We're talking six hours of D1, six hours of D2, but it represents beautifully. I also think this is a wonderful example of what you can capture with the C11 XLT at prime focus. Um, the DSOs are not off limits with this rig, and, and certainly the ASI 2400 MC Pro with its large pixels made for a great pairing. Now I know there are folks out there with tremendous processing skills and I'm sure uh, could do uh, a lot more with this data, but for a quick session I am not at all disappointed and this is a printout for my journal. Okay, folks, let's call that a wrap on the video. I hope you enjoyed the tour of Pac-Man. I hope you learned a little bit about uh, narrowband filters with one-shot color cameras. I do plan to do a video on broadband uh, targets uh, in, the, in the coming week or so. So look out for that video. And if you like astronomy and all things natural photography, please go ahead, subscribe. You'll love this channel, and I really do appreciate the support. And with that, I'm going to see everybody on the next video.